Moses delivered the law to the people and they sinned. Jesus delivered us from sin by fulfilling the law in his body. And that's what made Jesus greater than Moses. This is season 12 of Guerrilla Christianity. My name is Pastor Brett Walker, and I'd like to thank you for listening to Guerrilla Christianity, an unconventional, no apologies exposition of God's holy word from a traditional Methodist point of view. God's word is central to all that we believe, so let's get into God's word right now. I want to also invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 1 is where we are today. Uh, it's found on page 219 of the New Testament, if you're following along in the Pew Bible. Uh, we've been looking at the epistle of the Hebrews, and the writer has been making the case that Jesus is the Son of God who spoke directly to us in these last days. The witness of Christ is immeasurable. Through Christ, we are receiving the divine word of, from God himself. This is not a human prophet through whom God speaks, but God in the flesh, God the Son speaking directly to us. Today, we begin chapter 3 of this epistle and look at the comparison between Christ and the one considered to be the greatest prophet of Israel, Moses himself. Let us hear the word of the Lord today. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, brothers and sisters, holy partners in a heavenly calling, consider that Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. Yet Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses, just as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that would be spoken later. Christ, however, was faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if we hold firm the confidence and the pride that belong to hope. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Be with us now, O Lord, by your Holy Spirit. Speak to us in the stillness. Quiet our hearts that we may hear your voice. By your Son, reveal to us the mysteries of our salvation and your grace. For we ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. As you drive around South Jersey, as a matter of fact, as you drive around anywhere at all, you see many different types of houses. You see uh, estately Tudor mansions. You see uh, these McMansions in the, uh, in the developments. You see little ranchers. You see uh, colonial style. You see split levels. You see all kinds of different houses. But one type of house that always fascinated me from the first time I ever heard of such a thing was uh, the Sears Modern Home. If you know anything about the, Se the Sears, you could actually order a house from the Sears catalog. And they had over 370 designs. And what you were paying for was the, the designs themselves and the materials, much like Ikea, some assembly required. You basically put the house together yourself. But there, it's, it's astounding to me that over 70,000 of these homes were sold between 1908 and 1942. Most of them were sold in the Midwest. You see some out here on the East Coast. And a lot of them are still standing. That's what's astounding to me. They've been standing for, some of them, over 100 years. Well, that tells you that there, there is, there's quality in that work. But here's the thing. When you hire a carpenter to build your house, the carpenter, his motivation 
or her motivation. Let's get modern. Their motivation is that they get paid, right? Um, They're going to look at the plans that an architect gave them, and they're going to take and gather the materials that they need, and they're going to assemble those things. And at the end of them, if they do a good job, they get paid, right? The difference with these Sears homes, and the reason why I think so many of them are still standing, because the people who built them, by and large, were the people who purchased them and the people who were going to live in them. That's what made it so fascinating to me. These people were, they were buying these homes, they had the plans, they had the materials delivered to their location, and they would take the materials and assemble them into this house. Now, this is the house they were going to live in. So you know that they put all of their love and care into the assembly of this house. They took their time. They made sure that everything was in its right place. There was not one scrap of material left over. Unlike when I built a bookshelf, you know, from Kmart or, wow, I'm really dating myself. Kmart <laughs> hasn't even been around. Sears isn't around anymore either, is it? I don't know. But, uh, but when a house is built with love and care, it's built to stand the test of time. In the same way, God built his house on earth and it stands today, despite numerous attacks from the outside. Jesus once told a parable about two houses, one built on the shifting sands and one built on the solid rock. And when the storms of life came raging, the house built on the sand fell. But the house built on the rock stood. We are that house on the rock, built by God himself. And when we hold fast to our eternal hope in Christ, we too can weather the storms of life. Because as the hymn writer said, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Now, the author of Hebrews has been showing by logic and through the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus is greater than the prophets because he's God's own son. And thus he is greater than the angels also because they are created while he is begotten. Last week, We saw how Jesus is the acting as the high priest for all humanity, how he put to death death itself through his atoning sacrifice. And that brings us to where we are today. Now understand, by the way, that these epistles, um, this one, all of the letters of Paul, the letters of James and John and Peter and Jude, all of them were written to be read in their entirety in a church, in a gathering of the saints, okay, in the ecclesia, all right? But we, we don't do this anymore. We don't read these from start to finish. Maybe we should sometime because... They're not just speaking to the churches in that time. They're speaking to us today. But as it is, we're going through this uh, letter verse by verse. It's taking us some time. We're going to be doing this until November. But I do encourage you. I want to encourage you. Go home and read this letter all the way through. Each week, at the beginning of the week, I'm reading this letter all the way through to prepare myself for the very next lesson, which is going to be, because I want to see the whole letter as as one unit. And and I think it helps us if we can read the whole thing. It's only 13 chapters. Some of them are quite short. Um, and And I think the writing style lends itself to a certain flow. When I read this, it takes me just about a half an hour to read the entire letter of Hebrews. Um, But it is a practice that I'm trying to do each week because I feel like it it gives me a better grasp on the 
the overarching theme of the letter as a whole, and I hope it would do the same for you. So I just wanted to say that, but let's dive into this now. Six verses, verses 1 through 6 of chapter 3. Therefore, brothers and sisters, holy partners in the heavenly calling, consider that Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, was faithful to the one who appointed him just as Moses was faithful to all God's house, was faithful in all God's house. Let's stop there for a second. He says, therefore, so he's, he's gathering everything that he's told us up until now, and he's saying, because of everything that I've already told you, this is the next logical step, okay? In light of all this, he says, he's inviting his listeners to consider Jesus. Consider Jesus. He says, we are holy partners in a heavenly calling. Think about that for a second. You are here because you have been called here from heaven. By whom? By God. Our heavenly calling comes from God and we have received it from his son. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writes, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So this calling that is upon us, each and every one of us, individually and as a whole, comes from God. It's a heavenly calling, and we are holy partners in this heavenly calling. He says that Jesus is the apostle and high priest of our confession. So that has been made manifest in that he is sent from God. Remember that the word apostle means one who is sent He sent from God to humanity to declare God's grace and the good news. And likewise, the apostles, the disciples, were sent by Christ to do the same. And thus they became the apostles because they were sent. John chapter 20 and verse 21, Jesus said to his disciples, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, Even so, I am sending you. And it goes on. The apostles then would send the church into the world. God is sending us into the world through his son, through the apostles, through the church. Sending us into the world to declare this good news. Romans chapter 15, Paul writes, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Christ became a servant. Christ submitted himself to the Father. The Son submitted himself to the Father and he was faithful. He was sent, the the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful, verse 2, he was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was also was faithful in all God's house. Now, in the NRSV, was faithful in all God's house is in quotations, right? That's because it is a direct quote from Numbers uh, chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Hear my words, if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. Here it is. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly and not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. So for this reason... Moses was considered to be the greatest prophet by the Jews. And indeed, in the Old Testament, Moses would have been the greatest prophet. And yet, Jesus makes a remarkable statement when he says that among those who were born of women, there is none 
greater than John. Why? Why John the Baptist? What made him so great? Because he was the one. He was the one who ushered in the Christ. He was the one who proclaimed the coming of the Lord. He was the one who said, there he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But Moses was considered by the Jews to be the greatest prophet. Now, Jesus has been compared to the prophets. He's been compared to the angels and to the high priest. He's now compared to the greatest human figure in the Jewish history. Moses delivered the law to the people, and yet they sinned. But Jesus delivered us from sin by fulfilling the law in his body. Let me say that one more time. Moses delivered the law to the people and they sinned. Jesus delivered us from sin by fulfilling the law in his body. And that's what made Jesus greater than Moses. Moses couldn't deliver the people. He delivered the law to the people and they sinned. Jesus fulfilled the law and delivered us from sin. So, verse 3. Yet, Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses. That's what we're seeing here. Just as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. So the comparison of Jesus to Moses is likened to the comparison between the builder and the house that is built. Uh, the house would not exist if it was not for the builder. It is the builder's mind that conceived of the house. And it's his intellect that designed it to stand strong. Going back to my example of the, uh, the Sears modern homes, somebody designed those houses. Somebody knew exactly what materials needed to be assembled for that house to be built. Now, you could purchase one of these houses for what I would consider to be not very much. I mean, some of the prices in the catalog, $1,000, $2,000, they went up to like $4,500 for the most expensive one. That's nothing. I mean, even in those days, you know. But it's fascinating to me that so many of them still stand Obviously, the designer knew how to design a house that could stand for a long period of time. There's really fantastic photographs, by the way. If you ever go online and look at some of the photographs of these Sears modern homes, they're, it's quite striking in what good condition most of them are still in. You know? But I was also thinking about, this passage made me think of a house out in Western PA, you may have heard of it, may have even seen it. It's called Falling Water. By the way, the people who lived there hated the name that the architect gave to it. And the architect's name was Frank Lloyd Wright. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright, he was a visionary. He didn't like to do things the way people wanted him to. Um, he didn't do things the way they were expected. What made Falling Water so remarkable was that it was built using reinforced concrete on a cantilever system. It's, they're like upside down T's, a T coming down that's, suspended, that's supported from above that holds this seesaw of concrete, really, and yet somehow it stands. The house was built in 1936. By the way, uh, when Frank Lloyd Wright gave these plans to the owners who were buying it, they're the ones, uh, they owned a, uh, a department store in Pittsburgh. Um, they were so concerned about this house that they gave his designs to an engineer to, to look at. And the engineer came back to Frank Lloyd Wright and said, you need to make these changes. <laughs> and he said, okay. He didn't make any changes. Um, not only did he not make any changes, uh, there's a story that's told that the, the, the report of the engineer has been buried in the stones of the house. Okay? He was that petty about it. And yet it's still there. Built in 1936, and it still stands. Why? 
because it was designed to stand strong. And that's this house. Every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now, that Jesus is counted worthy of more glory than Moses is a striking statement considering what the scriptures say about Moses himself. Deuteronomy chapter 34, after Moses died, somebody completed the book of Deuteronomy. Some people say it might have been Joshua who was beginning to write his own chronicle. But in Deuteronomy chapter 34, it says, And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and the wonders of the, that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh, and to all his servants, and to all his land. And for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of Israel. There has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses. So for the writer of Hebrews to tell a Jewish audience that Jesus is worthy of more glory than Moses, that is a major statement. Now that God is the builder of all things, that's apparent throughout the witness of Scripture. I mean, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God spoke and the worlds were formed. A lot of times, people nowadays want to raise up humanity and lower God to our level. And actually, that was the first sin. It was the sin at the Tower of Babel. It was the sin of uh, Adam and Eve. And we try to exalt ourselves and put ourselves in a place of God. Not even considering that if this God did indeed speak everything into existence, if he, as you know, the, the, the Latin phrase is ex nihilo, from nothing, he created everything. From nothing, he created everything. And I don't mean he took all of the random atoms. There were no atoms. He created everything. He created it all. And he spoke it into existence by the command of his voice. And yet we think that he can't handle something as simple as, uh, I don't know, the weather. God is the builder of the church in addition to being the creator of the universe and the heavens. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God is the builder of all things. Now, verse 5. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that would be spoken later. Christ, however, was faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if we hold firm the confidence and the pride that belong to hope. So again, the comparison is made between Moses, a servant, and Christ, the son Moses is frequently called the servant of the Lord in both the Old and New Testament scriptures. Exodus 14.31 refers to Moses. Israel saw, this is right after uh, they had come through the Red Sea, after they had seen the Egyptian army wiped out. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Also, <clears throat> Revelation chapter 15, John in his vision uh, on the island of Patmos saw a vision of all of the holy hosts of heaven singing a song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Moses, the servant of God. So Moses is a servant. Christ is the son. And that's the comparison that's being made here. Christ, however, was faithful over God's house as a son. And, this is important, we are his house. If we hold firm the confidence and the pride that belong to hope. So that we are his house should give us assurance. Jesus is described as being over the house of God as a son. And we, the house of God, 
are in his able care. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16 uh, says, do, not, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? And that's how he builds this house. 1 Peter 2 and 5, as you come <clears throat> to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we are not just in the house of God. We are the house of God. We are the house that God has built through his son, Christ. And Christ is over the house and faithful as a son. Our hope is what holds us together as the house of God. We have an eternal hope in a kingdom that is not built with hands. We can be confident in the knowledge that we are safe in the trustworthy hands of Jesus Christ, our prophet, priest, and king, the very son of the living God. And so I exhort you this day, as does the writer of Hebrews, to consider Jesus, who left his throne in heaven to live among us, Consider Jesus, who was tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. Consider Jesus, who healed the sick, preached good news to the poor, and ate with sinners. Consider Jesus, who bore the wood of his own sacrifice up to Calvary for your sake and for mine. Consider Jesus, who died the death that we deserve and rose from the grave, conquering death and offering to us eternal life in his name. Consider Jesus, who even now sits at the right hand of God and intercedes for us sinners. For that is what we are, no more and no less. Sinners unworthy of his love, and that makes him greater than the prophets, greater than the angels, greater than Moses. His love for us is everlasting and complete. We do not consider our own merit toward our salvation, for we have none Instead, we consider Jesus, who is eternally meritorious and imparts his merit upon us through repentance and faith. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we look to you this day as the builder of this house of God. You have gathered us together as the body of Christ that we may bear witness to you in all the world. When we consider all that you have done for us, we think, who are we that you would be mindful of us? Yet your love is unshakable and eternal, steadfast and faithful. And so we give you great thanks for your sacrifice on our behalf and praise your holy name. All this we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you for listening to Guerrilla Christianity. My prayer is that you have been blessed by the hearing of God's word as I have been blessed in preparing this message. God has also blessed me by calling me to serve two churches in Salem County, New Jersey, Ebenezer United Methodist Church in Auburn and Hudson United Methodist Church in Pedricktown. We are two Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, Christ-adoring churches in the heart of New Jersey's farmland. If you live in the area and don't have a church family to call your own, I'd like to invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings. Ebenezer's worship service meets at 9 a.m., and Hudson's worship service meets at 10.30. And if you don't live in the area, get involved with the church where you are. We are not called to be Christians in isolation, but in community. So get involved with a Bible-believing congregation and be a part of the body of Christ. Now, if you like Guerrilla Christianity and want to help support us, there are a couple things you can do, and it won't cost you a penny. First, subscribe to the podcast on whatever podcast or platform you use. We are available on most platforms as well as on smart devices. We are also on YouTube with full videos of the sermons. Second, give us a like and leave a comment on the podcast. That helps boost our visibility and puts the message of the gospel in front of more people. Third, you can share these podcasts to people who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our mission is to declare the love of God in Jesus Christ to all the world. Stay in the Word, keep growing, and I hope you'll join us again next time on Guerrilla Christianity. Until then, remember this, Christ died for you, now go live for Christ.